directing a lot of questions to the high school as well during the presentation just to make sure that they're fully engaged and they are interactive with us. Right, high schoolers? Okay, let's start. First, welcome everyone to our Breakfast with Abuna series. I would like to thank Mr. Alberto Tommy. Alberto, thank you so much for doing this talk uh, this Saturday with the Breakfast with Abuna about the Maronite Church as history and identity. As you were saying, we used to give this talk many times to the seminarians and different places in Houston. And of course, we are all excited to learn more about the heritage of the Maronite Church. Uh, of course, uh, if you have any question, please write it down. You can ask uh, once we have time for a Q&A. Uh, now let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God, while we are ce celebrating your resurrection, your victory over death, we ask you to bring your light, the light of resurrection, to our life, to our families, to our church and society. Help us to enrich from your mysteries and from your riches, especially today, to learn more about the richness of the Mennonite Church. We ask you to bless each one of us, to bless those who help us to prepare uh, and uh, this event and make it successful one of the ladies who work hard also bless our CCE team in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit Amen and, uh, Thank you Abuna, my pleasure Thank you everyone and good morning Hello high schoolers So let's start before we get started with the presentation let's talk a little bit about identity Okay, so here's a question for the high schoolers. So you're traveling in Europe. Someone approaches you and tells you, oh, where are you from? What do you say? American. Speak up. American. American, okay. The band. So what do you base that on? Where you live, where you grew up, well, go backward a little bit, where you were born, where you were born, and where you grew up, and where you live, right? So three important parts of your identity, where you were born, where you grew up, and where you live. So when you're answering that question, where are you from, what part of your identity are you uh, revealing to others? Origin. Yes, but is it? Your cultural identity, your citizenship in which country, all of the above. Engage with me. Yes, yes? So when you're answering that question, I am American, what are you saying? I'm a citizen of America, right? So I carry the American passport. I'm part of the cultural traditions of America, right? Because I, uh, I grew up there, or I'm growing up there, I live there, right? So that's all part of one facet of our identity. Okay. Let's talk about faith. High schoolers. So when you are asked to reveal your faith identity, what do you say? I am a Christian? You keep it at that high level? Okay, what else? Catholic. Catholic? Maronite Catholic. Maronite Catholic? Okay, so we're digging in deeper, correct? So how many of you would say, I'm a Christian? I want to engage everyone here, all the high schoolers. Show of hands. Yeah? How many of you would say, I'm Catholic? How many of you would say, I am Maronite? Okay, so you keep it at a level where, you know, it's easily understood to others, correct? So saying Christian is, yes, you're giving an identity, a faith identity, but that's still at a higher level, because there are many Christians, many types of Christians, right? 
And then saying Catholic, you're narrowing it down a little bit more. Some of you who would say that I'm Maronite, you're even narrowing it down a little bit further, correct? So there are multiple layers of your faith identity. This is the presentation today. We're going to talk about the identity and the history, because it goes together, of the Maronite Church. Where does the Maronite Church fit into Christianity and into the Catholic Church? Just so that you have a little bit of background. And we cannot talk about that without giving some history and then diving into, into identity as well. So, quick question for adults, because I wouldn't answer the way they've answered. When you're traveling in Europe and they ask you, where are you from? What do you say? Houston. Middle East. Houston. Houston. Lebanon. Lebanon. Okay. So for those of us who emigrated to this country, our identity, you know, we repeat it in, a, in different ways, right? Because we have, where we were born is not necessarily where we currently live, etc. So we are a blend of, of cultural traditions and backgrounds, that type of thing, okay? So keep that, keep that in mind as well. So also for the adults. When someone asks you about your faith identity, what do you say? I am a Catholic, Catholic Christian, Maronite Catholic, Maronite Catholic Christian. Christian. Okay, so you keep it generic at the Christian level without any further. Okay, all right. So identity, very important. It's part of who we are culturally, socially, and religiously. So, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church and people on this earth who are Catholics are probably 50% of all Christians in the world. Those are the latest statistics. So roughly half of the Christians who inhabit earth are Catholics and belong to the Catholic Church in some way, okay? The Catholic Church, and look at this here, this uh, little nice chart. The Catholic Church, it's called the Universal Church, the Universal Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, which we call the Latin Church, is a big part of the Universal Catholic Church. But there are 23 other churches other than the Roman Catholic Church that belong to the Universal Catholic Church. All of those 23 are called Eastern Catholic Churches. And we, the Maronite Church, is one of them. Many of you who were born into other Eastern Catholic Church churches, Chaldean, Syria, etc., are also part of the Universal Catholic Church. Look at this. So, a right, R I T E, a right is a, a liturgical uh, method, approach, and language, right? So, a specific the way you pray, the way you conduct your Mass, and your traditions in liturgy. That's a right. In the Universal Catholic Church, these are the different rites that are all part of the Universal Catholic Church. Alexandrian, from Alexandria, Egypt. Three churches, the Coptic Catholic, the Ethiopian Catholic, and the Eritrean Catholic. They all follow those liturgical traditions and liturgical language. Rite, R-I-T-E. Armenian, they have their own rite, their own language their own liturgical celebrations and their own traditions. Again, we're talking about the Armenian Catholics here, right? Armenians are 90% Orthodox and 10% Catholic, but they do have a Catholic Church that is part of the Universal Catholic Church. So that's the right. Byzantine, look at how many churches in the Universal Catholic Church have a Byzantine rite. What is the Byzantine rite? It's truly the Orthodox way. It's, 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 it's how the, the Greek Orthodox 
church is the Byzantine rite. Their primary language is Greek, and their traditions derive from, you know, Greek Orthodoxy. That's the Byzantine rite. Albanian, Belarusian, Bulgarian, Macedonian, etc. The Melkite church, which we call the Greek Catholic church, right? That's, it has, it follows a Byzantine rite. So their liturgical traditions are, 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 are different. Uh, let's talk about the Syriac. In the Syriac, there are two different uh, rites, the East Syriac and the West Syriac. Okay? So the East Syriac rite is the Chaldeans in modern-day Iraq, and the Syro-Malabar Church. Syro-Malabar Church is in India. There are two Catholic churches in India, Syro-Malabar and Syro-Malankara. They are both Syriac rites. But Syro Malabar is East Syria, very similar to Kathia, and the Syro Malankara is West Syria, similar to the Maronite and to the Syrian Catholic Church. Okay? And then there's the Latin Church. The Latin Church obviously has its own liturgical traditions, etc. The basis for the Latin Church is Latin, the language, right? Before 1965, all of the Latin churches used to you know, the, the liturgical rite was in Latin. Post-1965 Vatican Council II, they changed to the local languages. So, Latin, okay? It's very important to understand that Catholicism is not just Roman Catholicism, the Latin Church. Catholicism, the Universal Catholic Church, is a beautiful mix, as Pope Saint John Paul II said. Uh, stated, the church is breathes with two lungs, the west, the, the west and the east, each one are the, is, is one lung of the, of the church, the west being the Latin church and the east being the other 23 eastern Catholic churches. So that's the beauty of Catholicism. All right. So identity, this is, this is where we are, Maronite down here. Right? The West Syria Rite as part of the Universal Catholic Church. So we're placing ourselves within the Catholic Church. All of these churches, yes, question. You say that the Orthodox is also part of the, with, with the kids here, uh, you missed the point here with my, with my son. Do you say the Orthodox are also part of the Can you talk again about the Byzantine, or um, uh, is it is the Orthodox Church part of the Catholic Church as well? Would you say, or I, I missed that with my uh, my son here. Yes, good question. The Byzantine rite. Remember, rite is a way of praying, the way of conducting mass, traditions, and language. All of these Byzantine churches, those are Byzantine Catholic churches. They have their orthodox counterpart. All of these churches also have their orthodox counterpart. So there's a Greek Catholic and a Greek Orthodox. There's a Russian Catholic and a Russian Orthodox. Right? The Orthodox part is not part of the Universal Catholic Church. They are on their own. They are structured differently. They are not part of the Universal Catholic Church. They are not part of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church that goes up to the Pope of Rome, who is also the Bishop of Rome. Okay? The Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, thank you. Is that clear? Okay. So, uh, yes. Of the 23, one more thing about the Maronite Church, just to situate ourselves. Of the 23 Eastern Catholic churches, right? Remember, there are a total of 24. There's the Latin Church, Roman Catholic, and then 23 Eastern. Of the 23 Eastern Catholic churches, the Maronite Church is the only one that does not have an Orthodox counterpart. There is no Maronite Orthodox. The Maronite Church is the Maronite Church. We're all part of the Catholic Church. We're the only church of the 23 Eastern Catholic Churches that does not have a Orthodox counterpart from, from 
the beginning of the church in the fifth century, we were in full communion with Rome and we stayed that way. We never split. When did that split happen? Another part of history as well. In the year 1054, it's called the Great Schism. So the, roughly the first thousand years of the church, we were all one church. In the year 1054, the Orthodox Church split away from Rome. There were several reasons, we're not going to go into it, it's part of a detailed presentation as well. Right? So that's when it happened, in the year 1054, that many Eastern churches split away from Rome and from the authority of the Pope. Right? And, and that's, you know, from that point onward, the Orthodox churches did their own thing. They no longer followed Catholicism and no longer followed the Pope. Right? So all of those churches who were mostly in the East, in the Middle East, within each one, they split. Some of them said, we're going to, no, 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 we're going to keep following the Pope. Some of them said, no, we're not going to follow the Pope. So within each church, Armenian, Russian, etc., it's split into Orthodox and Catholic. Did I explain myself well? So that's, that's the division. Okay? We were all one church together for the first thousand years. We are all apostolic churches founded by Jesus Christ, both the Orthodox and the Catholic. We are it. We are the genuine Christian church unlike other churches that came about much later, the Protestant Reformation and many other churches that came later. We are apostolic. So we trace our origins back to the apostles. So the Mennonite Church is part of that, okay? All of those churches, those 23 Catholic churches, are called sui iuris. What does that mean? It's Latin. They are autonomous churches. They have their own hierarchy, usually led by a patriarch. They do their own thing under the authority of the Pope. The Pope generally does not interfere in their affairs unless he has to, unless there is something that you know, he really needs to intervene with. Okay? So they are all autonomous churches, meaning that they have autonomy to continue to use their own traditions, their own liturgical traditions. And they do their own languages, and we do. But we are all part of the Catholic Church. So we are aligned with the Catholic Church on theology and doctrine. So the way we understand the Trinity, the way we understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is exactly the same. We are all aligned, right? Which is different than our Orthodox brothers and sisters. So all of the 24 churches that are part of the Universal Catholic Church, right, the Roman Catholic, Latin, and all the 23 Eastern ones, they are all aligned on theology. They are all aligned on the way we understand the Trinity, etc. But we have our own liturgical traditions. We pray differently. Our masses are a little different. Our languages are a little different. Traditions that we, you know, that we that we've had, you know, from from the beginning, may be a little different. Those traditions are also a reflection of the cultures. For example, the Chaldeans and the Chaldean Church is a reflection of the cultures of Mesopotamia. That's where it started, right? And all of the traditions of how they worship and how they worship Christianity all along. But they are aligned. The Chaldean Church is totally aligned theologically with the Universal Catholic Church. There are no differences, okay? Or some minor differences that are not major. All right, any questions so far? Let's go to our presentation. Let's blow it up. So does anyone recognize that photo? Sorry, it's a little blurry. Does anyone recognize that building right there? Yes? Okay. So that building is the headquarters of the Maronite Church. Where is the headquarters of the Maronite Church? It's in Lebanon. It's a little village called Kirki. Bajunye. So 
Some of you may know it, some of you may, may, may have been there. That's where the patriarch is headquartered. So that's the official headquarters. This is the coat of arms of the Maronite Church. You know, every church in the Universal Catholic Church has its own identity and its own headquarters. So you can you can see the uh, the Maronite cross with the three, you know, the cross with the three uh, lines. Right? The Roman Catholic cross is a simple cross. The Maronite cross has three lines in it. It's part of the coat of arms. Okay? You see the cedar of Lebanon. Cedar of Lebanon is part of the coat of arms because Lebanon is the headquarters and the historical heritage of the Maronite Church. Most of the years of the Maronite Church, although, although the Maronite Church did not originate or start in modern day Lebanon, but Lebanon became the uh, the, the, the homeland of the Maronite Church. We'll talk about that. Okay. First and foremost, Saint Maron. Who was Saint Maron? Obviously, we recognize him as the spiritual father of the Maronite Church. Right? Did he intend to start a church on his own? No. He was a monk who was part of the greater church of Antioch. Antioch is in modern day Turkey now. It used to be a big center, a big city, and a big center for Christianity. There were, there were, there were you know, several cities that were big centers of Christianity back then, at the beginning. Obviously, Jerusalem, Alexandria, modern day Egypt. Antioch, Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, and Rome. Those five cities were the big hubs of Christianity. Okay? Antioch. So, question for the high schoolers. Acts of the Apostles. After the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the Apostles. What happened there? How did the church start? <coughs> Anyone? Well, the Apostles went in several directions to start spreading the Gospel, to start spreading the news and establishing the Church of Jesus Christ, the Church that Jesus Christ established. Jesus Christ told Peter, who was Simon, Simon, you are Peter, the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. So, Peter and the other apostles went in different directions. Back then, it was the Middle East. They went in different directions to start to build their church, to start to spread the news. Who did they spread the news to first? We've talked about that. Who did they, who did they target first? Which communities did they target first to convert them to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did they target the pagans? Did they target the Romans? Remember, it was all the Roman Empire. No. They targeted the Jewish communities, right? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is essentially the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of Judaism, the continuation of the faith, the, the plan of salvation of God. And Peter, on his way north from Jerusalem, went to Antioch and then established the first community of believers there. So, as the apostles were going and establishing communities, those communities became Christian. They started to uh, practice their faith in Jesus Christ. And actually, in the city of Antioch, and that's in the Acts of the Apostles, it's the first place where the followers of Christ were called Christians. That was the first place in the city of Antioch. Antioch was a very, very important city. 
modern day, it's in, it's in Turkey, it's called Antakya. If you remember the big earthquake of January of 2023, it was all centered in that area. And Antakya, modern day Antakya was you know, severely affected by that major earthquake. Okay. That was the hub. St. Marin was part of that community. He was part, he was a monk. He was born around 350 AD, so fast forward 350 years forward, right? And died in 410 AD. We are much more certain about the date of his death than the date of his birth. We know for a fact that he died in 410, but we approximate that he uh, was born in 350. So he was part of the greater Christian church of Antioch, okay? And he lived as a monk in a monastery. And he had his own way of praying and his own way of connecting with God that appealed to a lot of people. So he had a lot of followers who wanted to go and worship like him to, 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 you know, to, to, to have that connection, to have that isolation. Right? And the followers of Maron became the Marrow Knights. Initially, it was just a movement of, of, of priests and people who wanted to become monks, etc. It was not a separate church, nor did St. Mary intend to start his own church. Later, it happened that way. We'll talk about it. Okay, so uh, he lived in suburban Antioch. He was influenced by a lot of great saints of his time and who were contemporaries of his time. Uh, saint Anthony the Great, he's a big saint, recognized by the Catholic Church, recognized by the Maronite Church, obviously the Roman Catholic Church. Saint Anthony the Great of Egypt, he is the father of monasticism. He basically invented the way you would go live as a monk. He went into the desert in Egypt and lived a life of solitude, right, and to be able to connect better with God. So the whole movement of monasticism was started by St. Anthony the Great, and St. Maron was influenced by that. It appealed to him. So he sort of emulated the, the monasticism of St. Anthony. Also, St. Maron was influenced by another major saint, St. John Chrysostom, the Arabi, by Yohanna the Habil Fem. Leith the Habil Fem, the golden mouth, right? Why? Because he was a great orator. He was also a bishop of Constantinople, and he, all of his homilies are still, we still have them, they're all recorded. St. John Chrysostom was a very, very famous bishop, famous orator, outstanding homilies, all the way, and, and St. Aaron was influenced by him. Uh, St. Chrysostom's uh, also uh, uh, inspired asceticism. So what's ascetic, asceticism, big word, ascetic? What does it mean to be ascetic? Yes, Anthony. What is monasticism? Okay, monasticism is when you're a monk. When you go live in a community of religious people, alone, away from the influences of society, from all of the, you know, background and static and pressures of society. That's, that's monasticism. That's, that's a way of life. Asceticism is also a way of life. And, all, and both monasticism and asceticism were, were an integral part of the way St. Uh, Maron lived. Asceticism is when you deprive yourself of all of the comforts of life and all of the, you know, the luxuries of life, you know, in the way you dress, in the way you live, you know, minimalist type of living, right? You deprive yourself, it's self-sacrifice, right? You choose to stay away from things that are comfortable, Right? Why? Because that's a way of sacrifice. That's a way of practicing your faith and connecting better to the life of Jesus. Remember, the life of Jesus was also <coughs> very basic, very simple. All right. And so St. Mary lived a life of abstinence, self-discipline, self-sacrifice, self-denial. You deny a lot of things for your life. You know, you choose to live in a very minimal conditions. Why? Because you don't want the distractions of this world to keep you away from your relationship with God. Is it working? No, just a second. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, 
So that's St. Mary. We talked a little bit about Antioch. This is where Antioch is. Okay, this is the eastern basin of the Mediterranean. This is modern day Lebanon right here. Syria is right here. This is Palestine right here, Jerusalem. Remember, everything started in Jerusalem. And then the apostles went in a million directions. North, east, west, and, and, and south. Okay? So this is the old Antioch. This is where it is. For those of you who are into geography. Okay, Antioch. Already mentioned this. One of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. First place where the followers of Christ were called Christians. It was a major center of Christianity for several centuries. It was a multicultural city. So people from all over the place lived in Antioch. People who spoke Greek, people who spoke Latin. There were local languages, Aramaic, and then an offshoot of Aramaic, Syriac, which became the liturgical language of the Maronite Church. All of those languages were spoken in Antioch and the greater Antioch. All major cities in the Roman Empire had, were multicultural. Remember, the, the, the time frame back then was all the, the Roman Empire. The, Roman, the Romans conquered all of the essentially Mediterranean basin, right, including that area. And Greek was there, why? Because from the days of the, you know, the Greeks, Greek was the formal language, the Hellenistic culture would dominate it. Latin was there because of the Romans and many others. Okay? Syriac, dialect Aramaic, was spoken there in the Antioch region. And many of our modern day churches trace their origins back to Antioch. I showed you in the Universal Catholic Church the different rites. You know, many of us, including the Maronite Church, we trace our heritage back to Antioch. As a matter of fact, our patriarch is called the Patriarch of Antioch and the whole East, right? Okay, Syriac Christianity. Eastern Christianity, basically, you know, in this part of the world, in the Middle East, uh, that was based on formative theological writings and traditional liturgies in classical Syriac language. So, they their way of praying, their liturgy evolved. Remember, they didn't have liturgy that was just there already. When the church started, nobody knew how to pray. They did not have a way of conducting mass. Right? They all developed their own liturgy, their own ways of praying. And, and the Syriac Christianity is based on a lot of traditional liturgies in the Syriac language. It flourished in the 4th to 8th centuries, and then gradually Syriac language. Everybody spoke it. In, in this time frame, from fourth to eighth century, it gradually faded into just a liturgical language, which is right now it's 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 retained, but it's just as a liturgy. Nobody speaks Syriac, although in Lebanon there is a movement to revive Syriac, but nobody actually speaks it, and we all speak Arabic, but our liturgical language is still Syriac, right? Monasticism, a little bit more. St. Anthony the Great, okay? We had a question about monasticism. So it's a religious way of life, fully dedicated to spiritual works, renouncing all worldly pursuits. So you are totally focused to being a monk, totally focused to, on your spiritual life, period. Okay? St. Anthony the Great is considered to be the father of Christian monasticism. And, he, and monks lived monastic lives. So St. Anthony the Great, I mentioned him, he's uh, from Egypt. Uh, he, he lived in the third and fourth century, essentially, uh, you know, a little bit before St. Maron, but his influence carried over, you know, many centuries after that, including to the, to the modern day. So he's still, he's still considered to be the father of monasticism. Asceticism. St. John Chrysostom, okay? So he died in 407. When did St. Maron die? 410. So he was a contemporary of St. Maron, okay? And also asceticism, practice of self-denial, includes fasting, celibacy, poverty, sleep deprivation, and many other ways, okay? So essentially you give up a lot of traditional ways, you give up a lot of comforts and luxury in life just to remain 
connected in a very strong spiritual way to God. Okay? And monks, they live ascetic lives. So monasticism and asceticism, key characteristics of the Maronite church. All right, so we already mentioned this, the followers of St. Maron were called Maronites. They are his disciples, people that he inspired. They wanted to live like him. They were all religious. They all lived in a monastery, right? Again, they were not there to form their own church in the early days. There was a monastery called the Monastery of St. Mary, and it was part of the Antiochian church organization. So the church in Antioch obviously had many monasteries, so think of it. Antioch is Houston, and you know the St. Mary Monastery was in Sugarland, right? But, but it was part of the greater Houston church, right? So part of the greater Antiochian church was, you know, that, that monastery was part of that, right? So many people were attracted to his way of, of life. Uh, the followers built a, lived in a monastery in the region of Akamiya in modern-day Syria, between Antioch and Aleppo. Aleppo, Halab. Okay? So between Antioch and Aleppo, the region is called Akamiya. That's where the followers of Maron built the monastery for them. Right? So they were already called Maronites, were followers of Maron, and that's where we built our monastery. But it was still organizationally part of the Church of Antioch, the Antiochian Church. Okay? Remember, this is the 5th century, about 450. Remember, Maron died in 410. St. Maron died in 410. So this was a good 40 years afterwards. So his movement, the way he lived, continued to inspire a lot of followers. Okay? And they slowly started getting more organized. I mentioned this, he never intended to start his own church, but then his followers became organized as a spiritual monastic community, meaning we're monks. We follow the way Maron, you know, St. Maron lived, and this is our monastery, and that's the end of the story, okay, back then. All right, so in the year 451, there was a major ecumenical council. So an ecumenical council is a council of all of the leaders of the church, back then the bishops, that were summoned by the Pope, the Pope in Rome. Remember, he summoned, and back then, in the fifth century, we were all one church, right? We weren't split. So the Pope in Rome, uh, and actually at the, at, the, at the behest of, you know, uh, he, he called it a meeting the behest of what we call a heresy. Right? What is a heresy? A heresy is when some priests or some bishops are trying to push forward a, a definition or, or a position uh, about Jesus Christ and who he was and his relationship with God the Father, about the Trinity, that was not in line with everybody else. So if there was a bishop or it was a priest that was pushing forth in a, a, you know, a teaching that was different and not aligned with everybody else, that was called a heresy. And typically, the councils were called to discuss that. Let's all get together and discuss what's going on and take a position, define a position. What is it that we believe? What is right and what is wrong? That's why the ecumenical church councils were called back then. And Chalcedon in 451, was a very important one. The heresy back then was the nature of Christ, right? So all along, all along, uh, Christians believed in the dual nature of Christ. Jesus Christ has a dual nature, human and divine. He was the Son of God, but He was born of Mary. So He got His humanity from Mary and His divinity from God, because Mary bore Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So, both human and divine. There were uh, some, I believe it came out of Alexandria. A lot of heresies came out of Alexandria, and I, bishops or so the Arian heresy there, that Jesus did not have a dual nature. He only had, you know, he only had one nature. So, when he became human, he lost his divinity. And so that was a big problem. 
So they called this council in 451 to discuss this. And the official position of the church back then was Christ has two natures, human and divine, right? And this is the official position and this is the truth. And everybody who's going to go against it is not aligned with our church and we're going to reject them. We're going to excommunicate them. We're going to, we're going to remove them from the church, right? That created problems because the followers, a lot of the Eastern churches who sort of believed that Jesus Christ only had one nature, not two natures, sort of said, okay, so who do we believe? You know, are we going to believe what the church said officially in Chalcedon, or are we going to continue to believe the other uh, tradition? And that caused a lot of problems. And the Maronites, back then, all of them stuck with the teaching, the official teaching that came out of Chalcedon that there are two natures of Christ. They stuck with it. They said, we believe in that. All of us as Maronites in the St. Maron Monastery, the followers of Mary, believe in that. And they were attacked. And there were 350 monks that were massacred. By whom? By other Christians in the area that did not believe that, right? So they, that created divisions. And up to today, we celebrate, you know, we have a celebration for the 350 monks who were massacred, right? That's it's part of our tradition of Maronites. Right? We stuck to the teachings of the Council of Castle. So we've always been aligned with the greater church, which became the Catholic Church. Okay? So that's a very, very important part. So the Council decreed that Jesus Christ has two natures, divine and human, united in one person. The Maronites defended the decision, which resulted in a massacre of 350 of their monks. Okay? All right, so fast forward to the seventh century, around the year 685, okay? So the Maronites, there was a big vacuum in the Church of Antioch. So the Church of Antioch did not have a bishop, okay? So there was a vacuum of leadership there. And the Maronites were very concerned that in that vacuum of leadership, they are not gonna be protected anymore. They're, you know, they're not under the wing of a bishop of Antioch that will protect them. So they decided they're going to elect their own leadership. That we are going to start creating structure for ourselves as Maronite. We no longer want to continue to depend on Antioch and the Antiochian church. We want to start forming our own church. And they elected St. John Maron, Mario Hanna Marun, as the very first patriarch of the church. So they elected him in 685 AD, a good, you know, 270 years after St. Aaron. Right? And then he started to organize the, the, the Maronites into a church structure. Okay, so St. John Maron, that's a key part of our history. St. John Maron was the very first uh, patriarch. Disciples, the religious community, okay, St. John Mary was elected the first patriarch in 685 AD, right? A little bit after that, after, after significant uh, persecution, remember, 685 was about 50 years after what happened in the Middle East, in the year 636, what happened in the Middle East? Islam, yes. Islam started spreading and started threatening all of the Christian communities, threatening them, threatening to, you know, force them to convert to Islam or, you know, eradicate them, etc. So those were very difficult times. In 685, it was, you know, a good 50 years after Islam started spreading. And, you know, the Maronites were feeling very threatened. One, there wasn't a bishop that was elected in Antioch we're concerned and threatened that we're going to be left alone and nobody can protect us, to the spread of Islam and the persecution of Islam, very strong persecution. So they were very exposed in that monastery in Apamea, between Aleppo and Antioch. They were very exposed there. So they started, and they were persecuted heavily, they started moving 
to the safety of the very high mountains of modern-day Lebanon, what is called Mount Lebanon. So they physically started migrating and moving, including the Patriarch, St. John Maron, into, into the mountains of, of Lebanon. Why? Because they were so remote and so high, it was very difficult for all of the invading armies you know, to go and find them there and exterminate them. So that was the movement in the, around the 9th century to that area. You know, at the end, they, they established themselves in Mount Lebanon, and that's where they, that's where they continue to be. All right. So fast forward <laughs> again. Uh, so Mount Lebanon, several areas in Mount Lebanon, uh, were the headquarters, right? The headquarters of the Maronite Church changed a little bit, and eventually settled in what we call now the Qadisha Valley, or the Valley of the Saints. Right? They eventually built monasteries there, and they lived there for a good 600 years. So all of the patriarchs, all of the leadership of the church continued to exist over there in that valley. One of our great patriarchs, who was recently announced to be, you know, to become blessed, right? So Pope Francis, a few weeks ago, announced that Patriarch Esfan Edwayi, who was one of our greatest patriarchs, uh, is going to be beatified. So he's one step closer to sainthood, right? So remember, sainthood is, first you are called venerable, then you are blessed when you're beatified, and then you are canonized to becoming a saint. So, uh, Patriarch Dwayhi is in the second phase. He is going to be, August 2nd of this year, he is going to be officially beatified. He's going to be blessed. He was one of our great patriarchs. He was the 57th patriarch of the church, and he was patriarch during those years, 1670 to 1704. He had a long 34-year stretch as patriarch, right? In that 34-year stretch, he reformed the Maronite Church in many, many ways that are still recognized right now as having been very visionary for the Church. What did he do? He tried to take the Maronite Church back to its Maronite roots, back to its original traditions, liturgically, etc. Why? Because, remember, this was year 1670 to 1700, so this was the 17th century. So the Maronite Church had been in existence since the 5th century. Right? This was the 17th century. So there was 1,200 years of evolution of the Maronite Church. Okay? So during those 1,200 years, and especially with the connection with Rome, the Maronite Church became Latinized. What does that mean? That means it started taking on a lot of the liturgical traditions of the Latin Church in Rome. So abandoning some of its original traditions and become Latinized. Patriarch Dwayne recognized that, and he saw a lot of value in bringing the Maronite Church back to its original Maronite roots. Syria, the language, the way we, the way we pray, the way priests, uh, you know, wear their vestments, the way the vestments are designed, they all of that started changing because you know it's called de-Latinization, right? So removing us, detaching us a little bit of, from the Latinization of the Maronite Church. So, uh, he reformed the church. He believed in the social importance of education and science. He was a genius in and of himself, right? At age 11, he was so intelligent that he was sent over to Rome to study in the Maronite College in Rome. And by the age of 20, he had a PhD. So, he was a child prodigy himself. He was very intelligent. At age 25, he became a priest. At age 40, he became a patriarch of the church, age 40. You know how young that is? That's super young to become a patriarch. So he's very well written. We still have everything that he has written up till now. Unfortunately, they're not translated to English. A lot of them were written in original Syriac and Arabic. Uh, there are some translations into French, but not, not to any other language. But he is considered to be one of the great patriarchs that the church has ever had, okay? Uh, he was also very vocal against the Ottomans. Remember, he lived in the time where the Ottomans and Uthmanian 
the Ottomans ruled the entire area. Remember, the Ottomans started ruling in the 16th century, in the early 1500s, all the way to the beginning of World War I, 1917, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed because they had aligned themselves with Germany and Germany lost the war, right? So there was a stretch of about 400 years of Ottoman rule, and the Ottomans, being Muslim, persecuted Christians in a big way. He was very vocal, Patriarch Dway, he was very vocal against the Ottomans, defending the Marianists and defending our right to exist and to worship, right? He was a visionary for his time. He was persecuted. He had to constantly flee because they were after him. They were after him to kill him, the Ottomans. So that's very little known of his, of his history. He was definitely a pioneer of resistance, uh, but he was persecuted and assaulted, actually. They, they, they were able to assault him a couple of times, but, but he survived. So that's Patriarch Dwayne. And I mentioned it, and I added the slide just so that you know, because on August 2nd this year, he is going to be beatified. Right? So he's going to be called Blessed, which is a big deal. He's on his way to Satan. And this is our very first patriarch on his way to Satan. We don't have patriarchs or saints in our church. All right, so let's talk about the identity. And this comes officially from the uh, synod, the big meeting of the Maronite Church between 2003 and 2006. So between, it's, it's a council, it's a huge council uh, and, 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 our, and our last one in this century so far. 2003, 2006, the Maronite Church, all of the bishops came together and decided, well, we've existed as a Maronite Church for, you know, 1700 years. We need to define a very unique identity for us. Remember, back to the word identity. What is our identity? So this comes out of the proceedings of the al Majma al-Maruni, the Synod, which happened in 2003 to 2006. Okay. So what are we as a Maronite church? This is time to take notes for the high schoolers. We're definitely Antiochian and Syriac. Remember, I talked about Antioch. Our origins are back to Antioch, because that's where we started. That's where St. Maron was. That's where the early Maronites were. They were part of the Antiochian church and the culture of Christianity in Antioch. We're also Syriac. Syriac was our original language. And remember, the Syriac rite, the liturgical traditions that were developed in the Syriac churches, right? That's part of our Maronite identity. We're Syriac. We're Chalcedonian. What does that mean? Remember the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451 that I talked about? where 350 monks were massacred. Why? Because the Maronites said, we are going to follow the teachings of the Council of Chalcedon, the dual nature of Christ. Christ is human and divine. We're not going to move away from that. And that cost the Maronites 350 monks that were slaughtered. Right? So we are Chalcedonian. That's part of our identity. We're patriarchal. What does that mean? That means our leader is a patriarch and is a patriarch based in Antioch, right? So our patriarch, currently, Shara he is called the patriarch of Antioch and the entire East, right? Because we are still, the Maronite Church is still officially headquartered as part of the Antiochian tradition, Antioch. We're ascetic and monastic. We talked about that. That's part of our religious identity. Why? Because St. Maron lived that way. And he inspired all of those priests to follow him and live like him and become monks like him and, 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 and adopt asceticism and monasticism. We talked about what monasticism and asceticism is. In communion with Rome, that's part of our identity. We never split from Rome. The Maronite Church does not have an Orthodox counterpart. We were always aligned with Rome, especially after the great schism of 1054 that I mentioned when officially Christians split in two pieces, the Western Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. The Maronites always followed Rome, so we're in communion with Rome, and we never change that. That's part of our identity. That's what makes us unique, right? Maronites are the only Eastern Catholic Church that does not have an Orthodox counterpart, like the Armenians and, the, and you know, all the others, the Coptics and you know, all of them. All of them have, have, have Orthodox and embodied in its environment. What does that mean? 
The Maronite church is no longer just in the Middle East, right? We're here. We're all over the world. We're in Europe. We're in Africa. We're in Australia. We're in the Americas. Everywhere. But we are Maronites. So we are maintaining our heritage. We are preserving our heritage. Right? That's what we do here. That's why, why many of you put your children in CCE to help them understand the heritage and to help us to continue with that heritage. That's what this part of the identity means. So no matter where we are in the world, we are still connected spiritually to our leadership in Lebanon, to St. Maron and the way he lived, etc. Any questions about our identity? This is a really, really important piece and really the heart of this presentation is our identity. And those of you who were baptized in the Maronite Church, you need to know this because this is part of your faith identity. Okay? This is the Maronite Cross. Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? We show it in our cross versus the Latin cross, which is just a cross. We, you know, we express the Trinity, we display the Trinity in our cross, the way, the way our cross is, right? All right, let's talk about saints. Saints of the, of the Maronite Church, right? We have, that's part of what makes us so unique. One, all of our saints currently, are all monks. They all lived lives like St. Maron, right? Although they all lived 1,700 years after St. Maron, right? They all lived monastic lives, ascetic lives, lives of self-denial, self-sacrifice. Uh, some of them were hermits, like Masharbe, meaning literally lived alone, away, self-sufficient, right? He grew everything that he ate. He lived a self-sufficient life. He didn't depend on any other worldly source for his existence, and he prayed. Okay? Saint Charbet, by far our most famous saint, right? And by far the most recognized worldwide, especially in Latin America. In Latin America, starting in Mexico, there's a huge devotion to Saint Charbet. Why? Because of his miracles. There is you know, through the intercession of St. Shadabit, there have been, God has granted miracles all over the world for people who pray to St. Shadabit. Remember, it's not the saint that does the miracle, right? God, God performs the miracle through the intercession of a saint, okay? So, St. Shadabit, uh, he was a monk and a priest. Uh, he lived in the 19th century, right, from 1828 to 1898. So essentially he died at age 70. Uh, he was canonized in 1977 by Pope Paul VI, and his feast day is on the 23rd of July. The Roman Catholic Church also has a feast day for uh, St. Charbel. He's, St. Charbel is also recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as an official saint. They have, I think it's one day after ours, July 24th, is when they, the feast day of St. Charbet in the Latin church. But in our church, it's on the 23rd. So that's St. Charbet. Our other saint, St. Rafa, okay, also lived essentially in the 19th century and died in the early 20th century, at the beginning of World War I. She was a nun. And she endured many, many physical sufferings. She belonged to the Lebanese Maronite order. Again, Saint Charbet. All of our current saints come from one order of monks, the Lebanese Maronite order. Rabaniye, Lebaniye, Maronini. Right? They are the, our largest order, our oldest and our largest order of monks. And they have, they have, they have very, very strong connection in the Vatican, meaning that they are very. You know, well connected in the Vatican, and they can promote the causes for these saints better than others in Lebanon. So, three saints currently, three of them from the Lebanese Maronite order. Rabbi, 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 She was canonized on June 10, 2001, by Pope John Paul II, 
and her feast day was not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, March 23rd. Okay, so that's Saint Tapa. Our third saint, current saint, is Saint Nantalla Kassab, or Al Hardini. Al Hardini, because he comes from the village of Hardin. So, Al Hardini, and he comes from the village, but his family name is Kassab, Nantalla Kassab. Okay, so he's he is a monk and a priest. He also belongs to the Lebanese Maronite order. Very interesting uh, uh, story about. Uh, Saint Nantalla al Hardini, in that he was a teacher of Saint Shadwell. He taught him in the monastery that, where they lived together. So he was a teacher and a mentor for Saint Shadwell. Okay? He lived a little bit before him, obviously, they overlapped a little bit. But um, May 10th, he was canonized in 1998 by, again, Pope John Paul II, and his feast day is December 14th. We also have a blessed. How many of you know of uh, Brother Sfan Nami? He's blessed. So he is one step away from sainthood and being canonized. And he was beatified. He was beatified back in 2010 by Pope Benedict XVI. Okay? And he is also a monk and he also belongs to the Lebanese Maronite order. Okay? Stefan Nami, brother. He was never, he was not, a, he was not, he was a monk, right? So he was not a priest, he was not a father, he was a brother. Ah. Okay, so he was a religious, just like nuns are religious sisters, right? So he was a brother, he was a religious brother, so he, he was not a priest. But he is also blessed. And he also lived, uh, uh, you know, towards the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. So where are we today, the Maronite Church today? We're still headquartered in Kirki, officially. Uh, we're all over the world. As I mentioned, we're part of the Universal Church, Catholic Church, the Universal Catholic Church, okay? So, uh, for high schoolers, in our creed, when we say, towards the end of the creed, we believe in one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Catholic is with a uh, lowercase c. Not with a capital C. What does the word Catholic mean in our creed? Yes. In Arabic, we call the Kanisa Wahida Jamia Mukaddasa Rasuliya Jamia means Catholic. Means Kirna Sawa Mabana. We're all universal. Right? So the word Jamia, which is Catholic with a small c, means we are all part of one universal church. Okay? I hope that's something that. You already know, but that's 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 who we are. That's how we profess. Uh, we are all focused on preserving our unique spiritual heritage and liturgy, our unique liturgy in Syriac, the Syriac language. That's why we still pray Kadishat Aluho. We still have the consecration in Syriac, so we are still preserving it. We're still trying to preserve. And then this last. This last bullet right here is very inspirational to all of you, back to your identity, those of you who were baptized in the Maronite Church, when someone asks you for your faith identity, don't just keep it at the 10,000 foot level on Christian, dig down and say, I am Maronite Catholic. Okay? So with that, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to some, to some questions. Oh, you know what? There are still a few. Let's talk about the leadership. No, we're not done. Just to give you the structure of the current Maronite Church, who is our patriarch? You see him up there in the presentation. Okay? Shara Ra. He's our patriarch. Let's dig down to our eparchy. Who is our bishop? You all know our bishop, right? What's his name? High schoolers. Yes, they did. How many times have you seen him here? Many times. He was here only week. Yes. He's our bishop. That's our leadership. Right? So, uh, this is right here, the eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon. This is the coat of arms 
for his eparchy. Right? So we belong to the eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon of Los Angeles. This is where our church here, Our Lady of the Cedar, belongs to. Right? This is our recording structure. This is our coat of arms right here for our eparchy. He is our eparch, right? Our bishop, our eparch. He's the leader of our eparchy. Now to our church. Who are these guys? Yes, our priests. Yes, this is our local leadership, Our Lady of the Cedars. Father Miren, who started the search, he's the pastor. Father Edward, he's associate pastor. Okay, so that's our hierarchy. Okay, our patriarch, Patriarch Ra of the Maranai Church, who does he have above him? The Pope in Rome. Who's the Pope? Francis. Pope Francis. Okay. That's how the Catholic Church is organized. Pope, and then the leader of a church, right? Remember, there are 24 total churches that are part of the Universal Catholic Church. One of them is Roman Catholic, it's called the Latin, the Western Church, and 23 in the East. Maronites are one of the 23. Our patriarch is Pshara Rabbi, right? Officially, we report up through the Pope. Now, with that, <laughs> Let's go to questions. And he's right there. Questions? Q&A. Raise your hand. So I dumped a lot of information on you, so I'm sure some of you have questions. Well, our patriarch is also a cardinal. So, in the good question. In the organization of the Universal Catholic Church, there is what is called the College of Cardinals that the Pope nominates. So, the Pope is the one who decides who becomes a cardinal. Who are these cardinals? These cardinals are generally bishops from all over the world or leaders of Eastern churches like our patriarch, etc. He's a cardinal. The College of Cardinals, what is it? It's an advisory board for the Pope. He reaches out to them to help him manage the affairs of the Catholic Church. Right? He doesn't need to, but they are his board of advisors, their consultants. Also, they have an important role in that when a Pope dies, the College of Cardinals, all of the members who are younger than 80 years old, they vote for the next Pope. So they elect the next Pope. So the College of Cardinals, everybody under 80. So if you're 80 and above as a Cardinal, you can no longer vote for the next Pope. Okay? Yes? Can, can someone help me with the uh, microphone, please? Thank you. Appreciate it. So, so help me understand your question. So is your question about uh, why do we have fewer Maronites now or do we have fewer Maronites living in Lebanon now? The, 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 yeah, in the Middle East and maybe in Lebanon, um, the Maronites are less and less. The Christians and the Maronites are diminishing in size. And, um, yeah, I think it's all geopolitics. It's not, it has nothing to do with the Maronite church itself in that you see in the Lebanese diaspora, 
the Maronite church is thriving in the Americas and everywhere. So in Australia, everywhere. So yeah, it's it's all geopolitical reasons. All of the departures of Maronites from the Middle East is all geopolitical, honestly, and, and socioeconomic as well. People are all trying to follow their, that's my opinion. Makes sense. Yeah, sure. Uh, can someone bring the uh, microphone over here? Thank you. How did you recover from the 350 months getting killed? How did they recover, meaning, uh, how did they recruit more months to keep going moving forward? Yeah, it's like, because that could be seen as like an attack not only to the church, but to the people that are participating in the church as well. So how could they like encourage more people to, you know, get back into the church and as well, like get the numbers up for the months? Yeah, very, very interesting question. Uh, obviously, this is the fifth century, right? So 451 AD. So we have very few sources, historical documents, to help us understand all of those dynamics that you're asking about. Yeah. But I would guess that the, uh, the, the Maronites, right, the followers of Maron, uh, had such a strong spiritual identity and culture that they, they kept on inspiring and attracting more and more people to follow them and their spirituality. So, before you know it, they probably recovered from the loss of 350 months and then continued to build uh, their group. Remember, back then they were just a community, a religious community. They were not a separate church. Um, you know, they, they did not become a separate church until 685 when they decided to elect St. John Mary as their first patriarch and start to have its own you know, independence and, and autonomy because of everything that was going on in the world back then, right? Mostly the threat from Islam spreading in the Middle East. Yes? And then, yeah, just one more question. So, do you, would you say that they were not particularly, like, hiding, but not full on with their uh, beliefs to everyone? Like, because you know how back in the day, like, how Christians would get, like, murdered for uh, openly saying that they're Christians, so they would have to, like, keep it, like, secret, and they would draw the sign of the fish on the doors and stuff. So was there any secrecy, or were they, were they just open about it? Yeah, yeah, so what you were mentioning was obviously the persecution of Christians during the Roman days. Right? So the first, essentially, 300 years of Christianity, uh, Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire, and people were persecuted, and Christians lived underground. Right? It wasn't until which emperor that Christianity became legal. I'm testing your knowledge of history. Constantine, right? The Roman Emperor Constantine, right? Whose mother was Christian. He was the one who changed that, right? He no longer, it was the Edict of Milan, the edict, in, in the year 313, I love history, 313, the Edict of, the Milan, of Milan, the city of Milan, right? He said that Christianity, from this point forward, is a legal religion, and people who are Christians have the protections of the Roman Empire. It's no longer illegal, right? But that was the year 313. So there was 300 years of Christianity being illegal and Romans persecuting them, right? I mean, all of the, all of the apostles were, were, were massacred in horrific ways, right? St. Peter was crucified upside down, right? Why? Because all of that was the Romans, the Roman Empire, the Romans persecuting uh, Christians. Right, or the followers of Jesus Christ, right? Because they did not want another religion to compete with theirs. And theirs was basically a pagan religion. They had many gods. You know, they worshipped everything. The sun, the moon, yeah, wine, do. this and that. Yeah, exactly. Good questions. Other questions? Over here. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Jacob, I was just going to ask if the Maronite church never disagreed What was, what's the difference other than location and the language that we were Yeah, good question, good question. So, from the beginning, the Maronite community, which later became the Maronite Church, was always in full communion with Rome. What does that mean? That they were always aligned with Rome and the way that the Western Church, uh, you know, defined our faith. 
the way they describe the Trinity, right? Our definition of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we were always aligned theologically with that. Although, as Mennonites, we had our own traditions that we were developing on how we pray. And we pray in Syria. Those are our own traditions. But theologically, the definition of our faith was always in line and aligned with Rome. We never split. And you said, why? Why did we never split from Rome? Well, for many reasons. Because the monks believed in the decisions of Rome and that Rome was the authority. Why was Rome the authority? Because of Peter, right? The authority of St. Peter and the succession of Peter, right? Which comes, the authority of Peter comes from Jesus Christ. Jesus gave him that authority. You are Peter, the rock, and upon you I will build my church. So that's why we've always been aligned with Rome. Also, politically, the Maronites uh, had the protection of Rome and the protection of the popes as well, and the financial support of the popes as well, to keep going on and survive as a sort of Catholic church in the Middle East. So, I gave you all of the reasons that I know. Questions? That was it the same. I, was, I wanted to elaborate on the fortune cookie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a unique part of our identity. You know, we were never apart theologically from the Church of Rome. Right? So, as a universal Catholic Church, we've always been aligned. The Maronites have always been aligned. We never especially after the year 1054, you know, with this with a big schism, it's called schism. Schism means a separation, right? With a big separation of the Orthodox in the East and the, and the Catholics in the West, the Maronites stuck with the Catholics. All right. Other questions? Yes, one right here. So, uh, so I have a question for Orthodox students. I like, uh, so they, how do they define the Trinity? Okay, so the Orthodox and Catholic are both apostolic, right? both established by Jesus Christ. We are the same church. Right? The reasons for the split, the two major reasons for the split, one of them was papal authority. Many of the churches in the East never bought into the Bishop of Rome and the successor of Peter having authority over them. Right? So that, that never sat well with that. But then with the, with the official schism and separation, they officially, they officially said that we do not accept the authority of the Pope. Okay? So that's one difference. The second difference, which is something that happened that year, 1054, Pope Leo IX, Pope of Rome, Pope Leo IX, made a change in the creed, the Nicene Creed, right? Our profession of faith, we believe in one God, etc., etc. He made a change without consulting all of the churches in the East. What was that change? That change related to the Holy Spirit. It's called the filioque. The filioque means that we, in our Nicene Creed, we say, uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. So this whole procession of the Holy Spirit, the Eastern churches had a big problem. Why? Because the original Nicene Creed said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, not from the Father and the Son. Huge theological difference. It may not mean much to you as you hear me say those words, but it's a huge theological difference in the Holy Spirit. And where does it come from, right? The original Nicene Creed, which the Council of Nicaea was in the year 325, shortly after Christianity became legal in the Roman Empire. It was our first big council where we defined the profession of faith, where we came up with the I believe in one God, etc., right? In it, we had said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, not from the Father and the Son. And that was a change that Pope Leo IX in 1054 added and made, which the Eastern churches disagreed with. So that's the second big reason of the split. They said, we're not gonna follow that. So now the Orthodox, when they recite the creed, they don't say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
They say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Meaning the origin of the Holy Spirit is the Father, period. So that's a theological difference. Don't ask me beyond that, right? It's a very deep theological argument. Don't ask me anything beyond that. Yes. So if that's the way they think, why they have a, like why they allow people to divorce and the, the Latin or the, the pop, they don't allow the people to divorce. So we don't have divorce, but they can divorce. Yeah, that came much later. Yeah. The whole issues of how, you know, how they deal with if they all speak like this, why they like Honestly, I, I can't answer that question, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I wish I was a, a scholar in orthodoxy, but I'm not a scholar in orthodoxy. I don't know why they do that. But, uh, but the, those were the two major differences, right? Essentially, we're the same, right? Except orthodox, they do not accept the authority of the Pope over them, right? And this, this whole theological difference of the filial way, the origin of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Everything else is the same. Yes. Any other questions? Any questions from back there, the high schoolers? We didn't didn't hear from you guys. No questions. Okay, Alex has a question. Are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so a lot of people say that like Satan can be translated as like the divider. Like Satan wants to divide us, and Christ wants to unify us. And then, as Christians, our main purpose is to love God above all things and to love each other as our neighbor. So, my question was, what then theologically is the benefit or the point of having different minds? Like, why not just have one? I'm, I'm, I'm totally aligned with your thoughts here. I'm in total agreement. Uh, Politics is part of it, right? Uh, power is part of it. Uh, there's a bigger, bigger picture of why why the split got got even deeper and deeper between the Orthodox and the Christians. Because when the Crusades within, within the twenty three rites of the Latin Church. Oh, within the, the twenty three rites of the Latin Church. Uh, tradition is a big part of Catholicism. That's a good question. Let's talk about tradition. So in Catholicism, we have scripture and tradition. Protestants are only about scripture. They essentially shed all traditions. Sola scriptura, as Latin means, only scripture. Right? Catholicism, scripture and tradition, meaning how we evolved in the way we pray, and the way we praise God, and the way we connect with God, those carry a lot of weight. Different peoples from different part of the world in the East developed their traditions differently, hence the right, R-I-T-E. And those are respected. Again, theologically we're aligned, but the way we pray and the way our, you know, we continue our traditions, it, it can be different. But essentially, we are one theologically. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yes, philosophically, I agree with you that why do they have to have so many rights? But again, nobody wants to blend into another right, right? You know, the Maronites don't want to blend into the Roman Catholic Latin liturgy, right? Again, language has language and cultural traditions have a, are a big deal. They are a big deal, especially language. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? All right, so with that, thank you very much for your presence and attention.